pre-show quid pro quo lance you get one question it can be uh how cool are my vines in my house it can be uh what is my favorite simpsons character it can be what is my favorite kind of dessert any question got to ask it and uh, i will answer it as honestly as possible go ahead well i was going to ask about the vines but i already did that before we went on air so yeah i'll i'll go with you've you've talked about wanting to teach yeah different things before on the show if you could teach one topic uh-huh. to people yeah what would that be if i could teach one topic to people oh man that's a rough one because <laughs> there's so much i think if i had my druthers it would be teaching people about uh grimoires i th- i i love the idea of grimoires and is such a broad topic, right? Cause you could say, well, why don't you just teach about Solomonic magic or this kind of thing? But I think that the idea of grimoires themselves and how they came to be written and what influence they had uh, when they entered into say cunning folk tradition, it's all so interesting to me. So, and I think that to provide context uh, to each individual grimoire would be would be really quite wonderful, and not only uh, the context of the grimoire, but the things that are in them themselves. I think that that would be something that I would be relatively uh, good at because when I was going through them and I was actually practicing some of the uh, the magic through them, I didn't, I, I had no like there's there's really not a lot of books besides techniques of of, of Solomonic magic by Stephen Skinner that really go through what to do with the books. But uh, I, when I started, I didn't have any of that, so. I think that I would be somewhat good at, at doing a class on, uh, on, on grimoires in general. So yeah, that's, that's it, Lance. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful question. <laughs> that sounds really interesting. Can I get a bonus little, little tweak question? Yeah, absolutely. On top of that one there? Go for it. How many emails would it take you to get from the listeners to make you create that course? <laughs> Well, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to get everybody's hopes up immediately. But, uh, <laughs> but here's the thing. The uh, <laughs> I've been doing a lot of thinking about monetizing somehow the podcast, and I know a lot of people would say, "Well, that's just like a Patreon or something." I want to go a little bit further, so I might be kicking around some ideas and putting up a survey sometime soon within the next couple of months as to what people might be interested in paying five to ten dollars a month to to take part in and this could be something like a book club where we go through a book a month that could be a grimoire it could be like a a jeffrey kripal book or a lockman book or something from scarlet imprint something like that or doing a separate podcast that's for members only where i talk to other magicians and get their personal praxis something like that but i've been kicking around a lot of ideas recently uh, due to not having any work at this point um so I, I think that something like that is very possible, Lance. I'll, I'll just say, I'll just say that it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a tease. But um, yes, there there might be a survey put out where I'd like to get your guys' opinions and what you'd most like to see me do, then uh, support the show in some way and support me. So, yeah, I think that uh, it's very possible. <laughs> awesome. Love it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lance. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to What Magic Is This, a podcast that would gladly tickle you with the feather of Mott. My name is Douglas Batchelor, and in this program, we're going to be talking about magic, the occult, the esoteric, the paranormal, the supernatural, and the weird. Now, if you've never listened to the show before, what happens is that I've got a guest on. Uh, This guest, I give them a list of about 15 topics. They get to choose any topic, and then I bring them in, and we get to talk about it. A lot of people have said, well, your guests don't do a ton of talking, Doug. And I say, well, try to think of these as more like a tutoring session, where the tutor will do most of the talking, but the student will get to ask questions if they have a question and they'll try to answer them as as best as they can with the knowledge that they have that would be the tutor doing that so try to think of the show this way one topic yeah we've got a great one today my guest is lance lance baker how are you lance i'm great thank you Perfect. Lance, you are a interesting cat. I just have to say this. Um, you emailed me, uh, how long ago? Maybe about six months ago or something, where you had a... I did a show about coincidences, and you were talking about the Melchizedek coincidence that uh, Jacques Vallée had, and then later on, 
Colin Wilson had a, a Melchizedek coincidence and you emailed me and uh, since then we've been kind of keeping in touch for uh, every couple of weeks and, and now a little bit uh, more more often but uh, you are a uh, energy healer therapist you do hypnosis you're one of those guys that just has an extremely interesting life can you can you share a little bit uh, about uh, what brought you to this I, I had a fucked up life to be honest for for quite a while I had a yeah. migraine 24 uh, 7 right for nearly a decade non-stop so i eventually decided to, to try the weirder sort of therapies to get a result for that right uh, and i did my toe in energy healing and within a week and a half of learning that boom no right. more migraine uh, so the esoteric had my interests big time nice. and uh from there those magical moments of weird unexplained things and just synchronicities that are too much of a coincidence started to happen mm -hmm. daily if not bi-daily sort of thing it was the universe grabbed my attention awesome <laughs> shook me up. very good uh, I couldn't walk away. No, I, I love it when that stuff happens. And that's, that's, I think for a lot of us, that's really what drives us to, to the occult. The ones that, that stick with it. I'm not throwing shade at anybody, but those of us that really make a life of it, it's almost like we can't not do it. And it's, it's something telling us you have to stick with this. You really, like, it's, this is in your best interest. And it sounds like in your case, this was definitely what happened. Yes. Yeah, for how messed up my life was before, I'd go through it all again yeah. to be here doing what I do today yeah. because I do not want a life where I just go to work, come home, watch telly, yeah. eat a microwave meal or whatever. Yeah. Uh, that sounds like that, that would be hell for me. Yeah. <laughs> right. But for, for a while, for a lot of people, that's that's what's only available to them. So it's... Exactly. Yeah, and it's strange how we get here, huh? It's 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 almost like we're telling the same story, but just minor di different details, right? <laughs> mm. Great stuff. And so, you have chosen an actual person to talk about today. Now, this is a, an episode that's going to be part of the Fools Gallery. The Fools Gallery, for those that don't know, is it's a it's kind of a section of the podcast where we talk about an individual who added a little special something to the to the occult or to the paranormal or to the esoteric and uh, we've got somebody really awesome to talk about today uh, by the name of Emmanuel Swedenborg who was a scientist he was a theologian he was a philosopher and he was a mystic and he was a man so great that they named a country after him sorry that's a terrible joke but uh, I had to tell it uh, <laughs> uh, for a period of time he was a well-known figure. Uh, he was huge. P people in England, in Europe, and in America, they knew him, they knew his name. He was one of those figures, and now barely anybody knows of him. He has been thoroughly relegated from everybody's consciousness, but for a while there, he, he was a figure that almost everyone knew. Now, when Lance picked this, uh, I sent him a, a, an email that basically said, oh, fuck yes, uh, because <laughs> as I do the show, topics are picked and then they come off the list and then new things get added. I think the very first, I think of the original list of 20 topics, five went down and so I only had 15, so I added another five. And of those five that I added, uh, Swedenborg is the last one that remains. So he wasn't on the first list, but he was definitely on the revi the revised list. So, so that's great. So... I just want people to know this is kind of how the show is going to go. So I'm going to do a small little life story for myself. There's going to be a small little life story of Swedenborg. And then I'm going to do the, the three M's of Swedenborg, which will be Swedenborg the man, Swedenborg the mind, and Swedenborg the mystic. So everybody ready to go? Lance, you good to go? I'm in my seat ready. <laughs> okay, perfect. So here's a little bit of a life story for myself. A lot of my esoteric interests started from pretty much one guy by the name of Robertson Davies. He was a Canadian writer. Uh, he wrote the Deptford Trilogy, which is Fifth Business, The Manticore, and World of Wonders. Uh, if, if you were raised in Canada, a lot of people had to read his books in high school, uh, and I was one of them. I had to read uh, Fifth Business. Anyways, before I became a practical magician, or I was actually doing uh, work, not just reading of these strange things, I had Robertson Davies from the age of about 16, I believe. And things like saints, Carl Jung, spirits, cunning folk, and magic 
came from him, basically. And he was my introduction to all of these things. And it was in a book called Murder and Walking Spirits, which I believe was Robertson Davies' second last book, where some characters are talking about Emanuel Swedenborg. So as I do, as soon as I hear anything in a Robertson Davies book, I'm like, okay, I have to look this thing up. And I, and I did. It was tough to find information about him. Internet was around when I was 16. I was only, it was only 2000. But I wasn't finding a lot of really good information. Everybody remembers the internet back in 2000 with the little spinny GIFs and uh, Adobe Flash everything. <laughs> Anyways, even going to encyclopedias, it'd just be a small little blurb. Like he, he was a mystic and philosopher and inventor and like a small little sentence. That's all I got. So I didn't really have a lot to, to go off of. Eventually, though, I found some more information. Now, I want people to know from about the age of, from the age of about six to probably the age of about 16. Uh, I was a hardcore atheist. Uh, I hated church. I don't know what it was. I didn't like the idea of church. When my family, we lived out in a small country, so we had to drive about a half hour to get to the closest uh, uh, church. And when my parents and my brother were going to church, I would literally, I hated it so much. I would literally sit in the car for an hour and a half while they were in church and listen to either Wagner or Beethoven that my dad had in the car, or I would, uh, what I would normally do if it was summer or nice weather, uh, I would just walk around the graveyard there. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot of um, old habits die hard, I'm just going to say that. Uh, when I started becoming interesting in William Blake, he, Blake came before Swedenborg for me, so I remember re that William Blake enjoyed Swedenborg and uh, for a little bit, and then he kind of had his, his issues with him. So Swedenborg was always kind of there in the background, a little thing. So he was a figure that would pop in and out of my life, uh, and he has for the last 19 years. And it was in the summer of 2018 where I visited London, and uh, I remember walking by Swedenborg House. There's a house that says Swedenborg House on it. And it was great. It was lovely. Uh, I went in. It was empty. There was nobody there except for one person. Uh, I spent four hours there just chilling in the reading rooms, going through all of the books. It was fantastic. And I had a, had a great time. Uh, and they gave me they gave me about like six huge books for about 10 pounds. They just they were so happy to have somebody there interested in Swedenborg. So, yeah, I've, I've got some really wonderful books from uh, from this place. But I bought a lot of books that trip. That was a crazy trip. I actually made my friend um, buy an extra bag so I could fit my books in his bag. Uh, anyways. <laughs> it was while I was there I bought this uh, this copy. I know you can't see it, everybody, if you're listening to the podcast, but this is uh, this is Heaven and Hell uh, from 1958. And I have to say, of all the books that I own, and I know you can't see it, everybody, this is the nicest book to hold. This book feels good to hold. They made good books back in the day. I don't know what happened, but uh, on the cover it's got Heaven and Hell, and it's got his uh, his family crest on there of a of a lion holding a key, surrounded by two uh, laurel wreaths. Uh, the crest itself, there's a mitre and two two stars, then two crossed keys, and then an erupting volcano with a arrow over it. That, so that's a pretty badass family crest, but uh, I love uh, that, that copy of that book. But he will always remain a very interesting figure to me, and uh, he's one of those figures that I keep coming back to because he, he's, he talked and he wrote a lot. I, I'm always interested to see uh, if there's something that I'm interested in if he, he talked about it, and uh, usually he does. Uh, Lance, why did, you, why did you pick Swedenborg? I, I'd heard about him from checking out Gary Luckman's work. I hadn't, I, now his Swedenborg book has, has moved up the list of my, my okay. to read pile. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's more just in his more summarizing works where he references him and right. Wilson referenced him. Yep. And I was like, well, that's, that's a cat I have to check out and yep. listen to and read and find out more about. Yeah. And in essence of the show, I picked the topic I knew the least about. And I figured, well, who does the best research? Doug can. <laughs> oh, st <laughs> I'll just stop sit it. Down and get <laughs> oh, that's very kind of you. You don't have to wax my Corvette, but uh, no, I love it. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Emanuel Swedenborg. So, so buckle up, everybody. Before we get into his life story, uh, why, why Emanuel Swedenborg? He was a genius. I just want people to know this uh, in, in the sense of the word genius. He came up with the nebula theory of planetary and solar formation before anybody else. Uh, he created many things, uh, almost like da Vinci. He was a, like a water clock and a submarine. He's known as the Scandinavian da Vinci. Uh, yeah. In his mid-50s, he had a very 
crazy spiritual experience uh, where he said that he uh, talked with Jesus, he visited heaven, he visited hell, he visited a place called the spirit worlds, and he visited other planets. And he's a huge influence on people like William Butler Yeats, uh, William Blake, Carl Jung, Helen Keller, uh, Borges, Baudelaire. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson called him a mastodon of literature. Yeah, and uh, after he passed away, uh, he also had his own form of Christianity, which is called to this day, it's still around, it's called the New Church. Besides his spiritual journeys uh, and his ridiculous feats of psi, uh, that's PSI, which are like precognition and telepathy and talking with the dead, while historic figures come and go with me, Swedenborg seems to always stay. So, with that, Swedenborg was born on January 29th, 1688, born Emanuel Swedberg. Uh, their family changed their name to Swedenborg when the family was ennobled in 1719. Uh, his father, although not when Swedenborg was born, he became a bishop. He was a very religious person, and his mother was hugely wealthy. The family owned a mine. Her family owned a mine, so they had money. From everything that I've read, he seemed to have been a happy child. Uh, although he did have this thing where he saw, he had uh, visions in imaginary playmates when he was, when he was younger. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. In 1703, he went to Uppsala University in Sweden. Uh, he went to live with his sister because his father really didn't support his scientific stuff. He wanted his son to be more religious, and they created a bit of a tug-of-war that uh, I'll, I'll speak about in a little while. Uh, his sister's husband studied the Kabbalah and studied a lot of uh, hermeticism, so he started to get this uh, influence from uh, his brother-in-law. Yes, father disappointed in the fact that he wanted to do science. Eventually, he traveled to England. Uh, what we have to understand is uh, when he did travel to England, Sweden had the plague at that point, and when your ship arrives from a territory where there is the plague, you have to stay on your ship uh, for two weeks, which, recording this on uh, July 10th or 11th, 2020, uh, this is something we can all um, identify with now is with all the quarantines happening, but you had to stay on the ship. And uh, Swedenborg, being the guy that he is, he said, uh, fuck that, I'm not doing that, and he escaped. And uh, he, he was having the time of his life in London. The authorities found him, and the punishment for breaking quarantine back in uh, the early 18th century uh, would be death. You'd be hung. You'd be hung for, for breaking quarantine. No fool Swedenborg. He made sure to have a clean bill of health before uh, he left uh, Sweden, and so he gave this to them and everything worked out, but he very nearly was, was hung to death. Uh, for, for doing this. He would travel and stay in England six times in his life, which is why there is a Swedenborg Foundation within London. It was while in London he might have become a Mason, although I'm pretty much 100% sure that he became a Mason. There's no documentation, but uh, I'm very, very sure that he became a Mason. It was here also where he was uh, hanging out with uh, Kabbalists and very interesting people, but he was also a DIY kind of guy. He wanted to know things about everything. He, his curiosity knew no bounds, and he would visit tradesmen and brass workers and watchmakers to just see how things would work, and he would ask them questions. It was within him to try and figure everything out, uh, which put him in, in very good stead. From London, he moved to Oxford for a little bit, and it was there that he was introduced to Edmund Haley, uh, the person who named Haley's Comet. More astrology, again, trying to figure things out. And in 1716, while in Sweden, he became a special assessor of mines for Sweden. Uh, he became an important character in Sweden. He wasn't somebody that everybody knew, but he was definitely within the, uh, the hoi polloi for sure. He really released a lot of scientific books uh, before his spiritual awakening, but he would always try and sneak some metaphysics in. That side was never gone. He would always try to put something very odd in there. And if you've read, read any of his works before he uh, went on his little uh, spiritual tear, yeah, there's always like a little thing where it's like, that's, that's interesting, but there's a reason for that. In 1737, he, he released a lot of information about uh, the brain and his speculations of the brain. These are really interesting. I want people to look them up if they're really interesting, but he, uh, he was definitely ahead of his time. He was a kind soul, a very interesting man. That tug of war that his, his father kind of instilled in him, he realized that he, science couldn't explain everything. Uh, he needed insight from somewhere else. He was always having these dreams and these visions and some very strange things happening to him. But on April 6th to 7th, the night of April 6th to 7th, 1744, 
he went to bed and he woke up not too shortly after and he was having a full-on mystical experience. His body was uh, shaking and tremors. He was sweating profusely and he eventually just fell out of bed. What happened was that, uh, that Christ appeared to him and said to him that it was his charge to share with the true meaning of the scripture. And he had this period, very much like Carl Jung, of a six-month dark night of the soul. He was not in a good place, but uh, it, was, it was his spiritual uh, awakening. In June of 1747, he quit his job on the Board of Mines, and he became a full-blown mystic, uh, writing about his spiritual experiences, traveling. He was doing very cool shit, uh, in my opinion, uh, and for whatever reason that he wanted. In the summer of 1771, he found himself back in London. Over Christmas, uh, he had a stroke, and it, it pretty much uh, crippled him. He was still able to speak, and he was still somewhat eloquent, but uh, he was very sickly after. And then on the 29th of March, 1772, uh, he died. So he lived a ripe old age. Friends said that after the stroke that he seemed excited to die, as if he was going on holiday. He was looking forward to, to it. And when one of his very close friends came to give final rites to him, uh, his friend asked him if he wished to recant all of his odd words about Christianity. And this is what Swedenborg had to say about this. Apparently he sat up and he put his hand on his heart and he said, As truly as you see me before your eyes, so true is everything that I have written. When you enter eternity, you will see everything. And when you do, you and I shall have much to talk about. Which is, that's some badass shit. That's, <laughs> I think as far as last words, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, he also predicted the exact day uh, that he would die on March 29th, 1772. He wrote a letter to his friend. And he was like, yep, I'm going to die this day. And he did. He was buried in England. Uh, his remains were moved to Sweden in 1912. The church where he was buried was demolished. And uh, now uh, there is a garden and a play area and a road that, uh, that has uh, Swedenborg's name on it. I have an interesting link to that part where he predicted his death. Go for it. That was in conversation with John Wesley, founder of the okay. Methodist Church. Right. Yes. So he he was told in his spiritual things that he uh, he had to to converse with Wesley because there were things Wesley wanted to know about him. And, Right, Wesley was was like, yes, there there is, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll see you later. And this was in like February, and he's like, well, no, I'll, I'll be dead in March. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so you can't do that. Wesley had these influences from Swedenborg, and later on he he went way deeper into those influences, yeah. and they influenced his work. My ancestors were in the circuit of where Wesley preached, and were influenced by that. No. And when they moved out to Australia, they actually planted the the first Methodist churches in this region. Really? So I know my ancestors were were influenced by Swedenborg. My great, great, great grandfather, who yeah. was a, a preacher at one of these churches, he was known for having an epic library and being an avid reader. So I know Alfred would have had Swedenborg's books Amazing. on his shelf. So as soon as I, I read that bit, when I was doing my quick little bit of research for the show, I was like, wow. oh, Maybe maybe that's where I've been getting the tap to oh, check nice. out Sweden for. It's like yes, read his books, read his books. Read it, awesome, read it. that's amazing. You're like you're like three degrees from Swedenborg. Do you, <laughs> I, that's crazy, man. So this this healing, just to get back to you for a little bit, this healing thing is it's kind of within you in a in a way. Exactly. Yes. Uh, there's uh, I haven't found what leaks of that Wesleyan healing thing they did here. It's on my uh, research list to check out how deep they went down that rabbit hole here or if they just took the preaching aspect here. I'm pretty good sure they were doing the healing as well. Uh, nice. I know I know they quite often help out with healing that I do. So crazy. I have a pretty, like that's, uh, that's, that's awesome. part of what they did. Well, you have you have to look up Swedenborg a bit more. <laughs> you, you definitely do. You definitely exactly. do. That's great. Wow, that's amazing. That's very cool. You've got great stories, and I love it, Lance. That's that's awesome. Crazy, brilliant. Huh. Okay, sorry. Time to get back. Um, let's talk about Swedenborg the man. 
So uh, younger Emmanuel was, he was a pretty bright and bubbly lad from all accounts. But as I mentioned, uh, growing up pulled two ways kind of thing. Uh, this is something that I, I keep forgetting about Swedenborg. It's actually quite a big part of his, his personality and who he was as a person. He had a, he had a, a really bad stutter. And I don't know why I keep forgetting this. His stutter made him think deeply before he would talk. People would talk to him, and it would usually take at least a couple of seconds before saying something. But when he did say something, it was usually incredibly eloquent and very pointed. So so his stutter definitely had a, a huge measure on how he carried himself in, in the world. Uh, another thing that I forgot, uh, besides his stutter, is that he had an insane sense of smell, apparently. And he it's one of those things that people who are somewhat more psychically inclined, a lot of them have a very good sense of smell. It was said that Swedenborg could tell when somebody was lying to him because he could smell them start to perspire. He was an amazing smeller. So, interesting, interesting character. I have a mate who has a weird psychic ability. He can smell your religion. No, what? Okay. Yeah, he, he can just smell the air around you and he can tell you where your religious influences are. I've tested him on a few people and they, he's been spot on so far. Spot like, on. He, he, I, I still don't get how that works with smell. <laughs> well, it, it is, but it does some. It, it is one of those things where a lot of people that do have um, really acute um, psi abilities, they have this this sense of smell that is is more than anyone else usually and they're like super sniffers basically it's and i'll, I'll talk a small bit about that a little bit later on but uh yeah no it's, it's really cool uh, on the list of superpowers i think that would be pretty low on my list of being able to smell somebody's religion but uh it's still pretty cool i gotta say <laughs> exactly it's because of my weird but cool list <laughs> yeah absolutely ripley's believe it or not uh, he always looked good. Again, his, his family was rich. Uh, at least his mother was rich. He carried himself very well. People were attracted to him. Uh, he was always the most interesting person in the room, seemingly, uh, from, even from a very young age. There's a book that I, that I downloaded. Uh, I, I didn't find it, but it was a book of, of correspondences. And it's about 350 pages of people just talking about Swedenborg, people that knew him. And the one word that they just keep bringing up over and over and over again is magnetic. He had a magnetic personality, uh, but a very benign uh, magnetic personality. He, was, he seemed a very kind man and very approachable. He seemed to have time for everybody. If he wasn't one of those people that looked down on people, if, if you wanted to talk to him, he was very approachable. Generally good-natured man. One of the, uh, the captains, as, as I mentioned, he used to take trips to, to London quite often. He would always take the same boat, and uh, the same captain would be on that boat, and that captain said that uh, Swedenborg was a good luck charm. He knew that it was going to be great weather, and that the sailing would go, everything would go fine when Swedenborg st- stepped onto his ship. One would hope that everybody is a good luck charm for somebody, so I'll just put that out there. <laughs> um, one thing, though, that's very odd about him is that uh, he had a very terrible opinion of himself. The idea of sin was something that was very important to him, probably because of his father. At one point, he said that spiritually, I am a stinking corpse. And one of the reasons for this is that he loved women. Uh, he was always DTF all the time. Um, <laughs> From what I understand, he treated women extremely well, but he also loved himself a little something-something. There's a term that's called uh, pelicacy, uh, which is a term that you can find in the dictionary, but it's not used very much these days, obviously. Uh, Pelicacy is just getting yourself a mistress. And uh, Swedenborg had a very healthy attitude towards sex, and he loved sex, very much so. And and he thought that um, it was the most divine manifestation of, of love, which, you know, it's, that's some hippie stuff, but it's still, it was, it was very important to him. Uh, he didn't have a wife, and he did not have children. Uh, from, from all accounts, he just seemed like a very human, very human person with some odd abilities. And there's two things that I really want to highlight here uh, and recognize. One of them is that he had this insatiable desire for being known and being famous, he made this very clear in a lot of the things that he wrote, uh, even when he was younger. He had some definite Ozymandian instincts. This would get used as ammunition against him later on that said that all of these strange experiences and the psi effects that he had were made up, but uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. But he carried this desire to be known through both his scientific period and his, and his spiritual period. 
the second thing I want people to know about Swedenborg is, is curiosity and knowledge. Uh, this is why I admire him. He would collect bones and trinkets and watches and clocks. He just wanted to know how things work, be it natural or spiritual. More was always his cry. He just wanted to know more. He needed to know more. And he was, he was insatiable about, about curiosity in general. He was a constant seeker, which is, I find, uh, very, very admirable about him. I think I would have liked him. I think everybody would have liked Emanuel Swedenborg. He, he was not egotistical. He was very down to earth, like many figures that I really like, very down to earth. There's stories of when he would be in the company of men. He would always have time for everybody, as I mentioned. But they would talk about, almost in the same way of William Blake, is that he would be there, but he would also be elsewhere. And even Swedenborg admits, like, when I'm in the company of, of men, I'm in the company of men and spirits. And, it's, and so he would, he would be having con- conversations with, with spirits while he would be talking with other people. Suffice to say, he, he seemed thoughtful all the time. So that's Swedenborg the man. Let's talk about Swedenborg the mind, or the brain, if you will. He was a scientist, but here's what we have to understand about science Scientists, it's not what we think of as scientists now. It's more of a branch off of philosophy. He wasn't crouched over test tubes. He was certainly thinking about things in order to open inquiry and to speculate. Very much like like Leonardo da Vinci, uh, he would doodle in notebooks. And in his words, he said that this uh, might be of some use to some future generation kind of thing. As I mentioned earlier, certainly a genius uh, in every sense of the word. And uh, here's some of the things that uh, that he did. So reading from uh, from Gary Lockman here, the Scandinavian da Vinci. The construction of a ship with its one-man crew could go under sea in any desired direction and could inflict much injury on enemy ships. A novel construction of a siphon whereby water can be driven from a river to higher places in great abundance and in a short period of time on the construction of locks, or everybody knows what a lock is, I hope, even in places where there is no flow of water, whereby a whole ship with its cargo can be raised to a given height in one or two hours, Uh, new machines for condensing and exhausting air by means of water, and concerning a new air pump worked by water and mercury without any siphon, which works better and easier than an ordinary pump, a new construction of air guns, a thousand of which can be exploded by means of one siphon at the same time, so basically a machine gun, uh, a universal musical instrument whereby the most experienced player can produce all kinds of melodies, these being found marked on paper and in notes, like an entertainment center. I think everybody knows of somebody who had one of those pianos with the, the reeds that go through. Yeah, basically that kind of thing. Uh, he came up with a water clock with water as its indicator, which by its flow shows all the movable bodies in the heavens and produces other ingenious effects. A mechanical carriage, which shall contain all kinds of works moved about by the goings of horses, and a flying carriage, or the possibility of staying in the air and of being carried through it. So basically an airplane. Of course, you know, none of these things, just like da Vinci, none of these things really came to fruition in his time. But yeah, he he did these things, but there were things that he did do in the real world. His most notorious one is that he moved the king's navy 15 miles over land to fight Norway at the Battle of uh, Friedrichsfeld in 1718. And he was quite uh, renowned for this, this crazy, crazy feat, 15 miles to get it from one place of water over land to another place of water in order to outmaneuver your enemy. I think that's pretty, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. I can't go into all of the details of the things that he did. There's just so many of them and, and please uh, look them up if this is interesting. But as far as astronomy and neuroscience, he was well ahead of his time. And a lot of the things that he speculated about the brain were to be confirmed at a later date, specifically with the brain and fluids within the brain. He did a lot of stuff with mineralogy and mining, being part of the mining board. Uh, his idea of mechanics, this this really came from what I mentioned last episode in materialism, of what was called new science. Uh, he was well-versed in René Descartes with Newton. Oh yeah, he also, I think, came up with the very first description of what we would consider a hologram. Yes, the Nobel Prize winning physicist and chemist, uh, I'm going to try and get this right, Savant Arrhenius, in a book called Swedenborg as the Cosmologist, which was produced in 1908. He contends that Emanuel Swedenborg perceived preceded Immanuel Kant and Laplace for nebula theory of solar and planetary formation, which is incredibly interesting t- to me. There's a ton of astrological speculations that he that he got bang on with the brain stuff. 
the importance of neurons. Uh, he was big on the idea of the frontal lobes being very important to us in how we act on a day-to-day -day basis as far as perception. He nailed that. He was big into brain hemispherics, which is something that I'm, I love it. I'm just going to put it that way. And uh, I made Lance by uh, Ian McGilchrist, the master and his emissary. I don't know if you've cracked it yet, Lance, but... Uh... <sighs> Introduction and start the first chapter. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes, but Swedenborg was all about the brain hemispherics. Uh, he was big into the cerebellum and, and the spiritual experiences and what happens with the cerebellum and spiritual experiences, as well as the idea of smell and the receptors within the brain. As a super smeller, that was, that was interesting to him. Another thing that he talks about a lot in his diaries more specifically is when he's on to something good, be it scientific or spiritual, he talks about a feeling, like a, a, an upwelling, like an upspring. And this is something that Colin Wilson and Maslow and pretty much every character that I've talked about, young, pretty much every one of my Fool's Gallery members uh, have, has talked about this, this upwelling of feeling when they know that they're headed in the right direction and they're doing something. You can definitely attest to this, right, Lance? Like, I, I get it too. Yeah. What, what does it feel like to you? Well, how do I feel it on a, on an energetic level? It's like a tingle, a tingle around you, but it's like a voice over your shoulder saying, "Fuck yeah!" <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> yeah. You, you just yeah, you just get a really interesting feeling, and if you follow it, yeah. the next step is always way easier than it should be, mm -hmm. and things seem to fall into place easier mm -hmm. when you recognize that upwelling. Right. Uh, if you ignore it. It's right. not quite it's, it's, usually. But I, I found that I've recognized that and allowed space to go where that direction is leading. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's always way more interesting than I ever expected it could have been. Right. Uncanny, I guess. Yeah, I've got this thing where uh, when, when I'm doing very imaginative things and if I know I'm on the right track, it, it feels like my spine is either like expanding and contracting. It's very physiological feeling it's just it's like my spine is breathing and it's very odd but it, I, i've known to recognize it it's like okay I'm, i know i'm on the right track yeah well you, your spine does breathe in that sense because yeah. it's got the cerebral thought going up and down yeah. it's going in right and affecting the brain and i only i listened to a podcast on the way in this morning and they were talking about one of his theories of of mixing the the earth and the heaven and the spiritual realms mm -hmm. uh, and they, they use the analogy of salad dressing oh the, <laughs> the three different elements to that and when you shake it off it's it's, it's all together right uh, and they said he had a theory that linked that with the cerebral fluid okay. and the brain and the way that works so yeah that's something to check out that I absolutely know well enough to explain <laughs> <laughs> but it piqued my interest big time and that could be part of what yeah with that. It is, and it's one of those things where it's like, as soon as it starts happening, it's like, I got to go this direction. Like, it, I've come to recognize it. I know something's happening. I can't just say it's like, I just feel weird, or maybe I just feel a little bit tired. I've become very attuned to it. And for people out there, I, th I don't know if everybody has this, although I doubt everybody has this, but if you can try and recognize symbols or things within you, or even your body, or just like a, an itching feeling or an intuition, please try to pay more attention to this. And I, I know for a fact, Lance, you'd be like, fuck yeah, yes, definitely. Like, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, when I started noticing those to begin with, I tested it mm -hmm. by by following it just to see what would happen. Uh, and I was like, wow, well, I, I look and feel like an idiot doing whatever this prompt is, yep. but I'll do it and see. And I would always notice some sort of sign along the way of good job that you listen. Sometimes I wouldn't know what that actually did for me yeah. other times I'd, I'd see things like I'd, I'd get the prompt turn down this street and go this way yeah. and I'd get through this long winded shortcut sort of thing and when I get to the other end there was an accent oh. that I have either missed being in or right. it just saved me being held up in traffic <laughs> okay. doesn't but matter <laughs> doesn't matter it, yeah. it helped me avoid it so. I like the word prompt that's a very good word recognize the prompts so maybe that's one of the messages from this episode. Recognize what the prompts are. And there's not just one. And I'm sure you definitely agree. There's never just one kind of prompt. There's many. For Swedenborg, yes, it was this feeling that is wellspring. Um, 
yeah, he definitely had this. Suffice to say, he's one of those people that nowadays we'd be shocked to think that he actually existed. He was just all over the place and just so wonderful in everything he did. Besides his scientific stuff, he was a bit of a philosopher. Uh, it's hard to separate his, his philosophy from theology and, and, and uh, the religious, but, but through personal letters, they reveal much thinking about humans' place in the earth and, and the cosmos. Uh, he was not merely concerned with things like uh, eschatology or what happens after death, although that was a very big thing, especially within Heaven and Hell, uh, the book that I think everybody should read of his. But he was very concerned about the here and now and what we do while we're here. Uh, he was a bit of a proto-existentialist, I would say. Two things that he was really big on was knowledge, because of course he just loved knowledge and learning more, but also action. And you can't have one without the other. Uh, now, knowledge doesn't just come from abstract places in Swedenborg's world. Knowledge bends to, to deeper meanings, but then from there you also have to engage, right? So, so you actually have to do things within the world with the knowledge that you have. Perhaps one of my favorite quotes about the meaning of life uh, as we live it now is from Emanuel Swedenborg. And I've got about 15. But this one is maybe up there in my, as my favorite. It might be up there with Alan Watts's The Meaning of Life is to Live, or Life Itself. But this one is great. His meaning of life was, do the good that you know. We all know good. We can separate things like ethics or morality and this kind of thing. But he was actually more about sensing the idea of good and then doing it. Actually to do the good that you know. He would talk a lot about things that we would now recognize as Hamlet's disease, where people would use and abuse the knowledge of life. I've talked about it tons in my last uh, two episodes with the uh, mental health and the materialism episode, and the fact that we've done a lot of squeezing the meaning out of the world. Uh, for, for Swedenborg, he thought that there was, in a way, a bit of a teleology or teleology, two things, and that we all have uses. It wasn't not so much purpose, although we would probably say purpose, but uh, as I understand it, we have to use the knowledge that, that we have. And, and there's three major things from my readings, and this is all lumped in under the good that you know. The first one would be passions, that we all have to have passions and the things that we are passionate about. And usually the things that we are passionate about, if we follow them and we go towards them, we're usually rewarded for them. And, and this is definitely a, a big thing for him. So if you follow your passions, normally that is part of the good that you know. The other one was life. And life in the way of creating life, propagating life, gardening, tending, being a caretaker. This was... Uh, something that he felt that all of us had to do. This is a form of engagement, supporting that in, in as many ways as you can. And lastly, because he was, um, you know, he, he, he was a lusty man. I'll just put it that way. Love. Uh, the last is love. And the more passionate acts of love that you have, the better. And, and just true general love. Love is one of those things, although it is an abstract idea, we can feel it. And uh, these three things, passion, life, and love, he said that they were, they were things that you sense and you feel and they're real and they're all around you and, and you have to go for them. To do the good that you know through these things. I'm going to read here another quick little thing from, uh, from Gary Lockman. Uh, this is from a giant-ass book I brought in London. Swedenborg's active life is one in which the rice gets cooked. It is a life attuned to the importance of making choices, of thinking and deciding for oneself, of using our knowledge and our will to cut a path through life, rather than depending on others to do this for us, or filling life up with so many trivialities that there is no room in it for anything else. Indeed, Swedenborg was a titan of the intersections between knowledge and actions, which is something that I find very admirable about him. So we got to talk a little bit now about the mystic Swedenborg. As a child, he did have that thing, very much like William Blake, where he saw spirits and, and talked to them. The reaction from his parents were very different than Blake. Blake's dad beat the shit out of uh, William Blake. Swedenborg's parents actually, they supported it. The saltiness of Blake, I think, comes from <laughs> that early childhood experience. Not entirely, but for Swedenborg, he was supported in the fact that they thought that there was something special about their child, you know, in a way. 
all throughout his life, he had these really crazy dreams. Some of them would come true. Some of them would just always visions, always dreams and visions. And a lot of them were precognitive in some way. And he seemed to think that they were somewhat prophetic. This tug of war between science and spirituality, it was very big in his life. And it started to take him over in a way, uh, as I talked about earlier, it was starting to make him sick. And on April 6th to April 7th in 1744, that was the night where, yes, physical sensations, shuddering, uh, and yeah, fell out of bed and he had a full-on out-of-body experience. Jesus came to him and basically told him or asked him if he had a clean bill of health, kind of harkening back to that uh, time in, in England where he was nearly hung for jumping over the ship and breaking quarantine. And Swedenborg was shocked that Jesus would say this. And, and he said, um, as you would be, uh, that uh, I do have a clean bill of health, to which Jesus says, well, do so. Well, do so. To which Swedenborg said that this means that it was now time to stop the science and to go full mystic, do the good that he knows for, for people that need meaning and true meaning in, in their life. For the readings of, of Jesus that I have uh, from Swedenborg, uh, especially through his visions, he almost seems like the dude from Big Lebowski. He just has this, he just, he says some very like, yeah, okay. Like it, it's it, almost like a Buddha-ish nature to, to Jesus. It's Swedenborg's Jesus. Anyways, just a little side note there. Uh, so no more science for Swedenborg. A little bit of science for Swedenborg, but more spirituality and, and journeying. So just very much like Jung and his and his uh, Dark Knight of the Soul. But he gave himself permission to let go and be, just be like, I'm going to go full into this. For six months, he was an absolute wreck. He was constantly shaking, terrible dreams, wonderful dreams, talking to spirits, angels, talking to the dead. It just was way too much. It was almost like he was going through a psychotic episode. And this is all very familiar. Like, again, this stuff is very, very familiar with a lot of the figures that I talk about. But eventually he got through. And from a very young age, uh, besides his stutter and besides the, the sense of smell, Swedenborg understood the importance of breathing. He would breathe and realize how he would breathe would affect his mental state to the point where he could sometimes take like two breaths a minute. He was experimenting with this his entire life, strangely enough, and he would definitely be part of that almost like Stan Groff, Stanislav Groff, holotropic breathing thing, as to use breathing to get into altered states of consciousness. And when he would do this, either through a hypnagogic state or just through almost like a trance, uh, he would visit, in his words, he'd visit heaven, and he would visit hell, and he would uh, visit other planets, chat with angels, and he would chat with spirits, and uh, yeah, he produced uh, two books that I want to, to focus on here uh, about these, these journeys. The first is called uh, Heaven and Hell. Heaven to Swedenborg was very familiar. It's, it's gardens, it's houses, there's flowers, uh, the angels are there, and angels are just like people. They, they, and, and in Swedenborg's world, the angels were dead people. All angels are dead people. And they would do their job, they all had jobs, and they would work, and they would eat, and they would drink, and the angels would fuck, and yeah, it was an inspiring place, his heaven. Hell, on the other hand, broken houses, brothels, dark streets, uh, the spirits there would argue and they would fight. I'm going to read again from uh, Gary Lockman here uh, on a Swedenborg biography that I will talk about eventually. The difference between these realms and our more familiar earthly dwelling is that here, while we may give lip service to the idea that our attitudes and choices create the kind of world we live in, in heaven and hell, this is literally and absolutely true. Although our limited earthly understanding must see heaven and hell as places... In reality, they are states of mind. In the very real sense, heaven and hell exist within our own consciousness. We are not sent there after death via the will of a patriarch or deity. We arrive at our own place in eternity through what Swedenborg called our true affections, our real loves and affinities. And although we may deceive others and ourselves about these while on earth, when we enter the afterlife, this is not so. I like this version of heaven and hell. I heard it described again as to who decides where people go, uh, whether one goes to heaven or one goes to hell, as where a tree falls, it lies. And the people that are doing the good that they know, they, they tend to go to heaven. But what's strange, and I, I might get a slap on the wrist because I couldn't find it when I was doing research, but I think for Swedenborg, this, these states 
people could go in between them. And somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, but like if you were in hell and you started doing good things, you can go to heaven. I might get a slap on the wrist. I, I, I was trying to find it and I really couldn't, but uh, I might be wrong. But uh, what we have to understand is that we have glimpses of these places in our lives almost every day. Heaven and hell are not psychological. They are an overall feeling. Everybody knows the feeling of heaven. I felt it. You felt it. Lance, you've felt heaven. Just like you have also felt hell. It's no different. That feeling. It's not a psychological state. I want to I wanna hammer that home. A state of things. Heaven is a state of things going well. When things are inspiring, everything's, everything's right. That state that you're in, that is heaven. And I just want people to understand that. I love it, in fact. But in heaven and hell, <laughs> there is another place, and this is called the world of spirits, which is an intermediate realm. Uh, it's kind of like purgatory. It's like a waiting room, basically. You're just passing time until you figure out where you want to go. So it's just basically be like, huh, I've got a choice now. Do I want to go to heaven where things are inspiring, or do I want to go to hell because I survive off of conflict and, and, and this kind of shit? So that's uh, just a little small taste of heaven and hell. It's certainly worth reading. And I, I think of all Swedenborg's works, this is definitely the one. And it is. It's been translated into more than, I think, 35 languages. It's a very well-known book, uh, for sure. Uh, what do you think about the idea of, of heaven not being a psychological state, but a feeling lens? What do you, what, does that resonate at all, or is that a... It, it does. I've had... A few experiences like Swedenborg's shaking and falling out of bed sort of situation. Jesus never appeared to me at the, the, the end did, of those, the, sadly. The dude didn't uh, abide. The dude didn't come. Uh, <laughs> he, he probably was, and I just didn't pay attention. Uh, but I've, I've had that feeling. So I definitely get that feeling of heaven. And, yeah. and some of the times I've felt that, that has been the exact, the exact thought I've put on it. Of yeah. If I had to put a label on it of what was going on, and every time after that's happened, things have leveled up for what I could do and understand. It's I've, I've never been able to stay there though. It, it's, no. it's a constant chase the dragon sort of thing. Right. Of, yeah. Of that that feeling. Uh, I read one thing about Swedenborg where he'd said where it got the the earth realm and the heaven realm and the spirit realm mm-hmm. and the earthly bit is just coming and going while these others are coming and going for us. Yeah. And, and when we pass, that would, the same us just transforms into those other two realms and just leaves that one yes. behind. And we are constantly in, in flux yeah. of, of all those different elements. And I could tell his meditation techniques there that he's, he's trying to chessboard himself around between those and work out when and where he can sit in right. one or longer yeah. without bouncing. It very much reminded me of just that the animus framework of right. of life. He he had some of it there. Right. Uh, yeah. He his his role was a bit neoplatonic. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, definitely there's there's something for everyone about Swedenborg and I think that's why he's a very crucial figure and has been since learning about him basically. Another book that's uh, that's interesting, and it's just going to be a short little blurb here. Uh, it's a book called uh, Earths in Our Universe or Earths in Our Solar System. Uh, that's right. He was not just uh, homebound to the terrestrial Earth. Uh, he would whiz around and visit all the planets. Uh, he would go to Mars, Saturn. Uh, yep, he would, he would go there. They all had their own angels. Uh, they were literally Earths in other planets to Swedenborg. It's interesting because they, they all have their own idiosyncrasies. He talks about what they can and can't, like the... I forget what it was, but the, um, I think it was Mercury. They can't see a certain band of light. And it's just, it's, it's very odd, but it's like, you can tell he's definitely doing it. Like in some way, it's real enough to him. Right. And that's a very important, uh, very crucial thing to recognize about him. But um, I was curious with that. I I didn't delve into that part of his life and just seen a small blurb about it. And my curiosity was, where does that crossover with astrological magic from the sound of things? He was in circles where he would have had that oh, yeah. influence. Yeah. So was he doing what he's put forward or was he doing astrological magic to talk to the, the spirits of these planets in that framework? And he's, 
he's dressing it up in his Christian framework to write. I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think he he has to apply the, the window dressing, but he was definitely doing way more esoteric stuff. Then I've mentioned in this episode, there's there's other characters, I forget the name, uh, Falk is one of them, but there's, there's, there's these characters that he meets in London and also in France, and it, again, this episode could very easily be six hours long, but he was definitely... I'm going to say it. He was an occultist. He really was an occultist. There's without a shadow of doubt in my mind. But his experiences, he had to he had to put a cloak around it. He had to say, okay, this there's this stuff. But astrological stuff, I think definitely. I think absolutely, Lance, for sure, for sure. And even reading Earths and Others Planets, you get that sense that okay, he's there's a little there's a little bit of the, there's some there's some stuff there. Uh, very odd book, but it is tr- it is true journeying. And if your idea of journeying is visiting other places, you have to read this book. It's wonderful. It's awesome. And if you love planetary magic and you haven't uh, read this book, give it a shot. It's really cool. Not just this stuff. Uh, as I mentioned, he was a precog. There are tons of stories from him and from friends. Uh, Remember, he predicted his own death to a friend, this kind of thing. But there's three big stories that everybody uh, tends to talk about. And I'm going to talk about them as well, because they're very illustrative of his uh, psychic ability, basically. Uh, The first one is called The Fire. So he was in Gothenburg. Uh, He was attending a party there, a gathering of people, and he was staying there for a bit. At one point, he had to leave the party. And he was very distressed uh, when he returned to the party. People asked, what's up, Swede? What's going on, Swedes? And he said, "Uh, there's a terrible fire. Uh, 300 miles away. Uh, it started in uh, a Sodermalm, which was where his house was, and it was spreading fast. He was apparently, like, very worked up. He was keeping to himself, but he was... People could tell that there was something wrong with him. He said that his friend's house was gone. About two hours after, though, he calmed down, and he said, it's okay. It's okay. The fire stopped. It's all good. And he, he even mentioned that the, the fire luckily stopped three houses away from where my house was. So it was extinguished before it got to my house. (laughs) Word spread very fast, like wildfire, if you will. And he had to talk to the the governor of the the state that he was in, in Sweden. And they had the information already as to what happened. Uh, uh, They had a messenger, and and they wanted to kind of test Swedenborg, and they asked him what was going on. Swedenborg described the fire perfectly, perfectly, perfectly. He nailed every detail, every timing, uh, every building that was, was taken down, like, it was miraculous. And word spread very fast. This happened. Like, this this is not one of those things where it's like it existed in his mind. This fire happened. This meeting with the governor happened, right? So this is incredible stuff. And it was it was to the hour. Yeah. And it took days for that news to actually get there. Yeah. That, that blew my mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he's... I love the guy. I don't know if you guys realize that yet. He's incredible. The second story is from the Queen of Sweden. It was said that he could talk to the spirit world. This was well known within uh, many circles within Sweden. The Queen of Sweden, uh, during a gathering, Swedenborg was there, uh, she asked him if he could talk to her deceased brother. And Swedenborg, being the lovely guy that he is, he went, sure, yeah, for sure. So they went away, and then when they next met, I think it was uh, months, months later, he basically said to the Queen, like, hey, I wanted to talk to you about your brother. Your brother apologizes for not answering your last letter. And then he says, I have something I have to share with you in private. So apparently he talked to this queen of Sweden and in a whisper. And the queen was apparently visibly shaken by what, uh, what Swedenborg had, had said. And to, to quote her, she basically said that no one but God knows this secret. So Swedenborg, he's definitely got some strange stuff going on there. The last story is from uh, a widow of a Dutch ambassador, a newly widowed. What happened back in the day is that uh, people would um, people were shitty. And so when there was a death, a lot of times people would come up and say that your husband has not paid for something that they've, they've done. When they actually have paid, they try to elicit more money from a bereaved person because it would usually be very easy to get money for them. The widow was, was positive that her husband had paid this debt. And back in the day, people would go to prison for debt. Like, they'd go to prison for a long period of time for debt. I believe uh, Agrippa went to pr- prison for debt for, for some certain things. Uh, could be wrong. A couple hundred years beforehand. But anyways, the widow was beside herself. She didn't know what to do. She was positive that this debt was paid. So she calls up good old uh, <laughs> Emanuel Swedenborg for help. And Swedenborg, again, being the nice, polite guy that he is, went, sure. So a couple of days later, he comes back. 
And he said, the debt's paid. Like, there's nothing to worry about. The debt has been paid. And there is a receipt in the desk, his desk drawer, your, your departed husband's desk drawer. And the widow said, I searched, I searched this, this, this drawer or this bureau. I searched it. There was nothing there. And he said, yeah, I know. There's a secret drawer in the desk. Uh, what you have to do is you have to go in. You have, there's this little latch and this and this and this and this. And he told her this. And she's like, oh, okay. And he said, all right, I'm, I'm going to go. So we board and zip, he's off, and off, off to visit, I don't know, uh, Saturn. Anyways, yep, he nailed it. He, she followed his instructions. She found, opened it up, and there was a receipt for the debt that was, uh, that was paid. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> he nailed it again. These are just three examples, and there's so many more. And they're, they're, they're really all quite incredible, but uh, yeah. Swedenborg was a member of the spirit world without a doubt, and he would talk about, specifically in his diaries, how, and this is something as, some, as somebody who likes grimoire magic and, and, uh, and even the works of Iambolicus, he said that spirits were like instruments. They had, they had a use. Each one of them had a use and a purpose, and that they can be utilized to tell you certain things and to get certain things from you. But he was also, when he would walk around, he said he would just see spirits everywhere. They were everywhere around him, just like William Blake. William Blake, his parents, I believe, were Swedenborgians, and I think for a while Blake was a Swedenborg. No, I know for a fact he was. He followed Emanuel Swedenborg, and then eventually he had a falling out because uh, Blake didn't like the descriptions of heaven and hell. And in fact, Blake wanted to have a marriage of heaven and hell. Anyways, just small little nitpicky stuff. But uh, the spirit world to Swedenborg was a very real place, and it was around him all the time. It's worth investigating, people. Yeah, look to his diary. It's it's very, very good. Uh, he was a mystic, certainly, in so many stories. Yes, this this is the part that comes through uh, most, that he was a true mystic. There's some other things we've got to talk about, though, about Swedenborg. And the first one is Christianity. Now, it was my biggest turnoff when I was younger, for sure. Again, I was very atheist-ick. I'm just going to say that. And it was tough when I first got interested in Swedenborg because as I talked with with Lance just now, it, to me it was it's a bit of window dressing, although I'm pretty positive that it was how it appeared to him. We have to understand, and I know people understand this, but it, it really needs to be said again, is that for a long period of time, and it's tough to think about now, for a long period of time, religion and service to God was the biggest part of people's lives. It was bigger than family. It was bigger than their job. It was it was the biggest thing in their life. It, nothing came close to it. And so this definitely had an effect on the way that people saw the world. Swedenborg's world also was very Neoplatonic, and it was a lot of emanations, and it seemed to have a bit of a hierarchy, certainly. And people would say, Doug, you shit all over Neoplatonists and, and blah de blah and, I do, but we, <laughs> I do, uh, guilty, but it was the best tool that they had at the time to try and understand the eighth role, and I think that we've, we've since have better tools, but for Swedenborg, this was his way of being able to, to try and fit things for these experiences. Uh, what we need to understand also is that the movement that came up after Swedenborg, he wasn't a part of it. Uh, it's called the New Church or Swedenborgianism. I don't know what he would have thought about these these groups. Uh, I'm not, if people are Swedenborgians or they're members of the new church, that's cool. I have no, zero problems. I, truthfully, I don't know a lot of their tenets, but I don't know what Swedenborg would have thought about uh, having followers. And it's one of those things that, like, I, <laughs> Lance, maybe we'll get your context. What if you're famous now, at least in my world, you're famous. How would you take it if you found out after you died that there was a, religious movement that that came up under you like how do you how do you process that uh i i i try and deliver in in all of the teachings i give to, for people to be their own unique self to connect into their version of what this is to mix and match it of how it fits in their life and there was something you said earlier where that was something similar of what Swedenborg was saying. Uh, I forget what it was. He had said that they did that. It was uh, do the good that you know. When he was was saying that, like mm. that's that says he understands that everybody's view of good and what's right for the moment mm -hmm. is going to be somewhat different because everybody's had a different upbringing and different influences of things. Not everybody had the chance to study as much as he did, no, no. or to interact with the different people he did, or to have the father he had. Yeah. So everybody's view is going to be slightly different. I would think 
with the way he seems to have approached life and his very individual relationship with God and Jesus the dude and all the rest, <laughs> yeah. his view would have been make it personal. Yeah. Have a real connection. Right. Use my work to help find your pathway yeah. and your version of good. I suspect that would be his mm-hmm. view in, in post life is you got it all wrong don't look to me for the answers look to me for a map to find answers for yourself i think 100 percent. yeah i think that he i I don't think he would be he might have been bemused by it like okay that's interesting but i think he would have been like guys calm down just i'm giving you as as you said lance i'm giving you a map i'm not giving you the directions like just look at the map and find your way yeah Mm. Yeah, um, but there is there is the new church and there is Swedenborgianism and it was a huge thing for a while. A lot, a lot of, as I said, William Blake's parents were, were Swedenborgians. Um, yeah, and it was a thing. It's still around and it's it's still it's still there. What we also need to understand about the Christian stuff, and I'm going to sound like I'm beating a dead horse here. This harkens back to the two way mirror thing. His experiences, the reflective side of the two way mirror, because religion was such a huge thing to him, that was what was reflecting back. But if we take a look at his experiences and just, if you look at his experiences, yeah, there's a lot of Jesus in there and angels and whatnot, but the shaking, the prophecies, the sigh effects, even though there's some Jesus on there, there's some Jesus salad dressing on there. Um, we all have tasted this salad um, and this lettuce. It's a terrible uh, way of saying it, but uh, we have to understand, again, Christianity was a huge thing for him. And, and to get to the true meaning of the scriptures. But if we look at the experiences with a comparativism, that old Jeffrey Kripal um, razzle-dazzle, yes, we start to see that he was definitely having these experiences, at least at least to me. So I think we need to understand this when we're looking. And if, if the Christianity stuff turns you off, look to the experience is what I, was what I would say, to try and see things from his perspective. Uh, and for this reason... There are people that say that Emanuel Swedenborg was probably crazy. Uh, I do not think so. I think that is an easy, easy out. As, as Lance said, and as I've said, I've experienced some of the things that he's talking about. And I'm only half crazy. I don't know. I can't speak for you, Lance. I don't know how crazy you are. But <laughs> I walk out of my office some days thinking I'm full-blown crazy. Yeah. And other days that everybody else yeah. is full-blown <laughs> crazy. And I'm the only one who understands what's going on. The world is very, very different to yeah. what we're raised to believe it is. Very much so. I would definitely say that. Yeah. And if uh, hopefully listening to this podcast, y'all realize that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's my job in this life. Make you guys realize that. Uh, there's other people, though, that say that he is lying and that he's just this, it's this lust for notoriety. He's just making this shit up. In some ways, Aleister Crowley is like this, just this wanting to be known to history and to time and to people when you're alive. Uh, But again, these do not talk to his experiences. And I think they fall into that category of what Jeffrey Kripal calls the supernatural. It's super space natural. The super natural in that these experiences are natural, they're healthy, and a lot of times they're quite banal. And... Swedenborg exemplifies this in, in a strange way. And on a side note, I'm just going to take a quick diversion. If you like Aleister Crowley, Swedenborg was basically saying the exact same things that Crowley said way before him. Just instead of do what thou wilt, it's do the good that you know. And I personally, this is coming from me, I'll take Swedenborg over, over Crowley in this way. The, the will thing gets me, uh, well, although Swedenborg does talk a lot about will, but I think the do the good that you know stuff, yeah, that's your passion your love and your life and the propagation of life, that's, that's really admirable. Uh, and to me, it's, he, he out Crowley's Crowley even before Crowley, in my opinion. But it makes the things that you read about Swedenborg and his experiences, they seem very real, whereas Crowley would window dress it as something like, I'm a sorcerer and I walked behind a man and then I was copying his moves and then I tripped and then he tripped or I blasted somebody with my rod. Uh, <laughs> Swedenborg, again, he would just say, I had this dream where I talked to these spirits and then this stuff happened, huh? which is far more human to me and it's far more relatable. But I do think that these things happen to him. I really do. And yeah, there are some extraordinary people in the world. There really are. And I, and I do think that he was one of them. 
somebody who would agree with me in this case was uh, Immanuel Kant, who will go down in history as the shit disturber of epistemology and everybody's epistemologies and saying that they're, they're all relative and blah, blah, blah. But uh, he was fascinated. He was incredibly fascinated with Swedenborg. And then he went through a period where he hated Swedenborg and he just said he was a sham and an art blah, blah, blah. And just uh, from what I read doing research before and uh, for this episode, it seems like Kant couldn't shake off his fascination with Swedenborg. I think towards the end of his life, he kept reading Swedenborg and even that whole nebula theory thing. I think he just kind of stole from ES wholesale, like completely ripped it off. But Immanuel Kant is one of those things that people that uh, are big on Immanuel Kant, they just, it's, it's a small curiosity. I think Swedenborg was a bigger influence on Kant than most people realize. And, and Kant is one of those people that Richard Charnas labels him as one of the three horsemen of the uh, ontological apocalypse that we're in right now um, in Passion of the Western Mind. But I'm going off on a tangent. Apologies, everybody. There's no consensus as to uh, what Kant really thought about uh, Swedenborg. Uh, we're winding down. I want to take a little break about uh, the idea of journeying or the idea of using your mind to do things. And it seems that Emanuel Swedenborg was a master, again, with the breathing thing and the visions and the dreams. Uh, he was not unlike Carl Jung, though, with his active imagination is that unfortunately Emanuel Swedenborg left no protocols on how to do this properly. Instructions not included in pretty much any of his books. But this is appropriate, I think, as, as I've mentioned in my astral projection soul flight episode, it's something you kind of have to figure out on your own. And I, I truly believe this. There are hints, and you can't get hints from Jung, and you can get hints from Swedenborg, things like breathing, uh, sitting comfortably, setting aside a certain period of time. I'm sure you'd agree that uh, that journeying is it's something that you kind of have to do. Do you do a lot of journeying yourself, Lance? It's a... Not as much as I used to. When you burn the candle at both ends, it makes it very hard to do journey. Yeah, you're a family and man. You have, <laughs> you have to allow time and space for it, and it's it's one of those things that I regret I do not make more time and space for. And as often as I regret it, I still don't make the time yeah. or space to do it as often as I would enjoy it. No, it's it's one of those things like I'm, I, I do take it quite seriously. And there's always seemingly like a, it's not a daily thing, but I try to at least do some kind of active imagination or hypnagogia or or journey, pure journeying, that kind of stuff. But uh, what we need to realize is that the fact that there's no protocols for this, and, and frankly, I think that most books that tell you how to do these are, are mostly garbage, uh, because it is very personal, and it is one of those things you really have to work on. The things that Swedenborg saw were very familiar to me, uh, strangely enough. And when you start to figure out how to journey, it is very rewarding. There are people, though, that do have what's called uh, aphantasia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. <laughs> Uh, it's people that it's people that uh, they can't see they can't picture things visually in their mind. Um, oh yes, yeah. yes, I have that. Uh, yeah. I, it's very rare I get a uh, visual in my mind. Really, I, I didn't know the correct term for it. Uh, okay. So yeah, uh, I will hear it perfectly. In it's weird though. I dream and I I, I see feel everything yeah. when I'm in dream. But when I try and create it, and even if it's an artificial dream, if somebody puts me into a hypnotic trance. It's very, very rare I get to see huh. something. But I am there, and right. it is real, and I can feel it. Right. Sometimes I can smell it or taste it as well. But it's like I've got a narrator in my head describing everything mm -hmm. as my body feels it. It's, yeah. it's a bizarre thing to put words to. But the first time I journeyed, I was expecting visuals. And <laughs> I went on an amazing journey with all sorts of things that I, I could not have thought I could have created but it it happened and it was super real and I did not know what was coming next till that narrator told me what was coming next okay. it, was, it was definitely enough proof that it was outside of me but I was expecting the visual and I didn't get it I was so disappointed till I sat with it and realized well I didn't need no the visual I think the visual would took away from it. Really? Uh, huh. Sometimes. Uh, other times I'd, I'd be like, just give me the fucking visual. It'll be so much easier. <laughs> That's frustrating. But, but at other times it, it makes it more real because yeah. how many things do you see you cannot put a word to? Correct. 
And when you feel it, you still still can't really put a word to it, but you can put a knowing to it a little easier. Right. Uh, it, yeah. I don't know, it just feels more true to me and, and, and personal. I have the reverse, so I see more than I feel, but I get exactly what you're saying. And that's one of the ways for people to, I'm not going to say suffer, because in some ways it's a gift that if you're not able to see things visually, it's like sense what it would feel like to feel a rock in your hand or a breeze on your skin. And that's, a, that's as valid of a journey as seeing something in your mind. And in some ways, you nailed it. It's more beneficial in some ways. It's, it's seemingly more real because we are visual. Um, those of us that do have sight, the feeling, I think, is, is tough for a lot of people to get. Uh, to, to help people understand, think of the first time you were in love. If you only watched the visual of the first time you felt love, that's that's going to be worthless, really. Like it's going to give you a piece of it. But if you could feel it, then you're there. That's beautiful. I love that. <laughs> I love that, Lance. Yes, a hundred percent. No, that is really a good way of putting it. Yeah. So yes, these guys they give hints. They give hints as to how you can do it, but uh, it's on you to get it right. I think it really is. And as I mentioned, the things that he said they they seem somewhat familiar to me, um, especially in his journals. The angel stuff, here's the thing, they don't really get talked about too much these days, and particularly with people that are interested in angel magic, it's, you always have the big angel magic guys, you know, you've got uh, the Heptameron, and you've got uh, the Arzalmadel, and you got uh, John D. Swedenborg is never in that conversation. When I was playing around with the Heptameron, I was having a lot of trouble with it, and it was very difficult for me. Demons or spirits, whatever they were, they were far easier to get, far more tangible. The entities within the Haptameron are angels. There's one for every day of the week, and there's seasons. And Anyways, uh, I'll do an episode on it, no doubt. I would spend weeks, not on a daily basis, uh, more when it was appropriate astrologically, and the d day of the week was correct. And I was having no luck. It was, it was like a dead end. It was totally fruitless. And eventually, I was like, I need to do something different. And so this might be a bit weird, but I brought a pillow with me into the circle and a blanket. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to try and see if I can get them some other way. So I just laid on my back, head on the pillow, and I just kind of put myself into a hypnagogic state. Uh, it becomes somewhat easy to me. And they showed up real quick, uh, the angels. It was, it, it was Samael. And it was like a bolt of lightning. And the angel... It's, it wasn't like the angels that are normally described. The angels were more like Swedenborg's angels, and that might have been because I, I, I've read a lot of Swedenborg, so they're very familiar to me. But Samuel seemed like just a normal dude, like it was a person who had lived before. No wings or anything like that. And, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that try to find different ways of approaching things. And in the Heptameron, they never say, like, do hypnagogia, but that is how I tried to, that how I tr how I cracked that thing. Whereas other grimoires, sometimes they appear visually, sometimes it's audible, sometimes it's a feeling. For these guys, I needed some other tech to, to bring in there. And uh, Swedenborg kind of helped in this way. I was like, okay, what did he do? He did this stuff. Breathing, relax, just take it easy. Don't want so much. Like, don't just lust after these things. Just relax. They'll come. Just take it easy concentrate on breathing and they did and it, it was quite shocking it showed up and it was like it's party time but uh, it was it was quite brilliant figure things out on your own i guess that's one of the major points of this podcast please figure things out on your own a to b instruction is never helpful at least i've never found it helpful find the hints pick out the hints and go from there and uh, i don't know if you agree with me at all in that way yeah if uh if people want to get to the the slower breathing thing that swedes did I can give you a YouTube clip of a meditation, Absolutely. part of a meditation class I've got that they can learn that extended breath. Absolutely, for sure. So yeah, that's my little uh, my little story there. Um, uh, if people are interested in angels and angel magic, Swedenborg is a treasure trove of things that most people have not looked into as far as angel magic. And I'm here to tell you, if you love your angels, look towards Swedenborg for a bit. Yes, there's there's definitely something there. And it's not as clear-cut as everybody wants to make it. But, uh, yeah, uh, that's a good thing. It really is. So we're winding up here. And uh, where to go if you want to know a bit more about Emanuel Swedenborg? Of Emanuel Swedenborg's works, you have to read Heaven and Hell, in my opinion. It is a must-read. I think it's a must-read for everybody. 
just get it. Just read it. it. You can find it online. It'll be in the show notes, guys. Yeah, give it a read or get yourself a wonderful 1958 uh, copy from the Swedenborg Foundation in London. Uh, anyways, uh, Earths in the Universe or Earths in the Solar System should read as well. Really cool, especially if you like planetary magic. Definitely check it out. Or if you like astrological magic, please. Again, this is untapped stuff. You can't remove the Christianity from Swedenborg, but you can see past it to allow you to see some of this experience, and it is very familiar, as I've said. Uh, I quite enjoy his diaries. I love his diaries, his dream diary and his spiritual diaries. They're really cool. He wrote a lot. He was constantly writing. Again, he was a mastodon of literature, as Emerson said. There's tons of great stuff in there, and it's very personal, and it, it's, it's him. It's just untapped Swedenborg. If you want to learn about Emanuel Swedenborg, there's one place you got to go and one guy, and uh, Lance mentioned his name, uh, Gary Lockman. He's got two books. Uh, one is called Into the Interior. It's hard to find, and it's a bit expensive. It's fantastic, but otherwise, you can get a very good book. And there was a book I was reading from earlier. It's called Swedenborg, An Introduction to His Life and Ideas. It's great. You can read it in a day. Wonderful. It'll give you everything you need to know. And there's um, a little section in the back there of a brief summary of Swedenborg's major works. And go through that and see if any of that interests you, because that's, that's really quite... Uh, quite great. But Gary Lockman, I keep bringing him up on the show. He's one of those guys like Jeffrey Kreipel. The Swedenborg Foundation, you can order some of Swedenborg's books from them. They're very good. Or you could do what I did and go to the, uh, uh, if you live in London, pop by Swedenborg House. Seriously, it's it, you, you've seen this house, I'm sure, if you lived in London. Pop by. It's lovely. It's charming. It's, it's great. You can go to the reading room. You can just relax. They don't pressure you. They don't want you to join a cult or anything like that. It's, they're just happy to have people there, and I'm not trying to throw shade or anything. It's a lovely place. It really is, and, and you will be able to buy, at least I did, to be able to buy a lot of his books. Just going to put it that way. I would say for those people interested, spend a month on Swedenborg. Just give yourself a month. I gave him like a week when I finally got some of his books, and it turned into about four months. But as I said, he's never far away. He's always kind of there. And I greatly admire him in a lot of ways. Um, deserves some time, and he's a somewhat unknown figure. For me, he pops up again and again. And I had to ask myself when I was doing this episode, why is this? So in conclusion here, the figures that really attract me, they seem to keep pulling me back to them. They all have one thing. And it's something that, uh, it's, it's two words that I got from Alkistis Demetch, who just released a, a short journal entry. She's one of the owners of Scarlet Imprint. And it's called Libido Shendi. And it translates from Latin to lust for knowledge. I love figures that are always curious and people that are always lusting to try and know more. And it's not for find, trying to get answers. It's for curiosity's sake. It's curiosity for curiosity's sake. Libido shendi is one of those things that I think that you know what it is and you have it. You can definitely orient your lives to this thing. We've been talking about it, Lance and I, this entire episode. If it moves, follow it in whatever kind of prompt and how you feel it, go for it seriously and the characters and the people in the fool's gallery they're there for a reason because they have this swedenborg he did not content himself with the material he knew that there was something else he was beyond smart but very humble he was beyond extraordinary but he didn't squander it he's exactly my cup of tea and he's constantly passed over for figures that seem to speak louder and they seem to say more but in a stubborn way Swedenborg, he just sits there, smirking knowingly, smiling kindly, waiting to be discovered. It is our job to seek out the seekers. They have much worth listening to. That's the show. <laughs> Let's. You made it. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. It's, uh, it, it is inspiring. And I do want to check out more of his work. Uh, I, I, think, I think everybody should. Give yourself a month. A month of Swedenborg. Yeah, it's, it's really good. You can just read Gary Lockman's book and then go from there. Read Heaven and Hell. That's that's basically what I would say. I'm curious to read some of those jour dream journals, mm -hmm. not just for the, the interesting insights that he had, but it sounds like it's going to be some interesting pornographic sort of things uh, from some of the tr tr <laughs> truth, Truthfully, um, actually, he, did, he, did, he didn't write um, 
it's not like the Diary of Samuel Pepys, which is basically a diary where he talks about all the women that he uh, had sex with, but he does mention it. It's not as um, lustful as, as you'd like to think, but he does mention that. Yeah. He's like, hey, I, I, love a good, uh, I love a good roll in the hay, a bit of the rumpy pumpy. I'm all for it, and I think it's a good thing for everybody. But I'm a sinful creature. It's like, ah, buddy, you got to get over that. And I think by the end of his life, he did. So, yeah. That's we have to wrap up Swedenborg's episode and talking about him having sex. Why not? He would have loved it. He would have loved it. <laughs> Lance, I just want to before we uh, before I do the little uh, sign off here. You have a podcast, and you also have a, a the correct term would be like a clinic because you are an energy healer. Do you want to do you want to give uh, give the elevator pitch for for what you do because I think it's incredibly important. And I've I've actually done uh, one uh, one and one kind of one and a half. Unfortunately, I had to duck out, but of of energy work, and I found it incredibly fascinating. This is for somebody who is very skeptical of the idea of energy. I just don't think the terminology is proper, but I'm getting over it. And Lance is helping me with that very much. But uh, yeah, Lance, give yourself um, give, big yourself up a bit here because uh, I want people to know about the work that you do because I think it's very important. Uh, I, I have a clinic here in Newcastle, Australia, that I, I do hands-on and hands-off healing and subconscious healing with hypnotherapy-based tools. Mm-hmm. I do that sort of thing online as well. Uh, my greatest passion within that is, is teaching. So I've come into the office to do this chat today because I didn't want to have to race from home because right now I would have had anxiety if I was at home of getting here on time oh. to be able to do the class. Uh, I'm running a class here teaching distance healing where I teach people how Energy works not over just space that you don't have to be in the same room as somebody to give healing, but it also works across time. And we'll, we'll do some time travel experiments and all sorts of stuff awesome. with that. Energy healing gave me my life back. So it's one of my greatest passions of, of sharing that out and helping people get over physical or emotional issues within that and seeing how when people learn it themselves, it's, it's a very big road opener. Uh, paths forge ahead of you that are more interesting than you could have picked for yourself beforehand. Uh, and within that framework, the pathways of hypnosis and subconscious healing opened up for me from, from that. Mm-hmm. And I, I find that just as, if not more fascinating sometimes of the way our minds work my life is is about helping people achieve their true potential and to let go of the trauma of the past and the lies we tell ourselves and create a new story that is all about more love joy and happiness yeah i love that and this podcast is all about stories and i think we all love stories and i know that you do it's called branches of healing is it not Yes, branches of healing uh, yeah. can be found on everywhere. It's pretty easy to find me on, on Google from uh, just Healer and Lance or branches of healing. Perfect. And people can book an appointment with you if they don't live in Australia. You can you, you're you're good to do Zoom. I've done an appointment and it was some pretty interesting stuff. I'm not ready to talk about it yet, but uh, there was definitely some interesting stuff that happened. But um, yeah, uh, to summarize sessions with me, shit gets weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is very strange, but it gets uh, interesting results. Uh, I, I do Zoom sessions with people, and I'm being in Australia, I'm used to the fact that my time zone sucks for most people, so I often will be up at 4 or 5 a.m. to do a session or staying up till 11 or 12 in the night to start a session. Uh, I, I work within the time zones of, of the world, I understand. <laughs> you don't want to wake up at 3 a.m. to get therapy. Uh, I do that so I'm for you. You're a, you're a hospitalier. You're a soldier for, for healing, and I love that. That's, that's really incredible. You also have a, a podcast, do you not? Yes, uh, Akasha Talks. Uh, it is not as regular as yours. I started it weekly, and I started about the same time this one started, and I'm maybe half the episodes in a view. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's turned into more of a every three or four weeks I, I drop an episode now. Yeah. Uh, I, I have too much going in my life to make that the forefront, considering it's, it's yeah. just a, a gift I give out. And... I try not to have filler episodes within that now. Uh, so it's just, if somebody's on, I, I think they've got something interesting to share. And, uh, and I'm, I'm tossing up what the best way is to, to have you on of what conversation yeah. we have. 
<laughs> I can't wait. People that are interested, I will put up a link to both branches of healing as well as the podcast uh, Akashi Talks. I have to say, um, from the one exercise that I did with, with Lance, it was incredibly interesting. And I highly recommend it. And if you guys feel like uh, supporting, Lance is a, he, it's in his blood. He is a born healer. And I want people to realize that. And uh, if you can support that, it's not just for, for him. It's more so for you. And Lance really puts you first. And uh, whatever model that you come at with the world, uh, Lance is able to adapt. And it's really quite beautiful. And I, I love what you do, Lance. And I think you're a very important person. I'm, I'm super lucky to, to have met you through this podcast. I really am. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I feel uh, super lucky to be able to listen to your podcast. <laughs> a, a, a great summary thing of so many fantastic topics. Oh. And I swear your name every 10 days for the extra books I have to order. Uh, sorry. <laughs> for all the interest. <laughs> sorry, not sorry, everybody. Just want you to know. I mean, <laughs> it's one of the things that I'm, I'm getting about a tweet a day of being like, I have to buy this book now because Doug said so. So I'm not sorry. I hate to say it. I love books, and you should too. And it's it's how I got a lot of my knowledge. I really do believe at going it alone. And as I talked about in this episode, pick up the clues and adapt them for yourself. So please uh, find Lance. Of course, there'll be show notes about that. And those show notes will be on whatmagicisthis.com. Head there. You can subscribe to the podcast on either iTunes or... Guys, if they've got podcasts, I'm listed. I'm not going to list them all, but yes. If they've got podcasts, I'm there. Also on whatmagicisthis.com, you can find links to my Twitter account, my Instagram account, and my Facebook account. As mentioned, show notes. Tons of show notes. This one, they're going to be a little bit slight. Um, I think that there's there's a ton to read about Swedenborg, but uh, the information, it's out there, and you guys can find it. But there will be some interesting things that I put up uh, for Emanuel Swedenborg on there. But the best thing to do is to actually read about him. If you enjoy the podcast, uh, please leave a review. For sure on iTunes or anywhere else, but even besides that, if you love the podcast, please tell a friend about it because uh, sharing is caring. And I'm getting more listeners. I want people to know, like my more people are cottoning on. Which I'm not just trying to toot my own horn here. I think we've got something special, and I can't do it without my listeners. And you guys are great, and I love you. And uh, yes, if you tell a friend, I love you even more. I don't even know how that's possible, but I'll make it possible. If you have any questions, uh, do what Lance did. Lance reached out to me. He uh, wanted to share an experience, and I love experiences, and I love hearing about them. And he, this was something cool that happened to me uh, that you were talking about, and it, then this happened. I want to talk about it. And so he shared with me. If you have uh, something like that, please share it reach out to me. I'm very approachable. I'm not pompous in any way, shape, or form. Well, I might be if you try to talk about the Golden Dawn or something like that, but uh, whatever. But yes, please reach out. I will answer. This podcast, guys, I've got some uh, great stuff coming up. There might be some irregular releases over the next two months as I may be ducking out to visit the woods and the wilds every once in a while. You will still get three episodes a month. I promise you that. They might be released a little bit in, in clusters, like two might be very close together. But yes, you will get three episodes a month, I promise. Yeah, that's it. And Lance, we got to end the show with the post show quid pro quo. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. From my interactions with you, either through Zoom or through Skype or through email, you are a quote machine. You have some great quotes. And I love all of them, and they're ones I have never heard before. But I have to ask you, what is your favorite quote, and why? Oh, uh, my favorite one at the moment. I think I think I did tell you. It, it's it's in the background of, of my my home office. I've got a, a picture somebody made off an Abe Lincoln quote, where he's it's, it's, it's a bear. It's not Abe uh, sharpening an axe. Abe Lincoln, so, Abraham Abe's, Lincoln. Yeah, Abraham yeah. Lincoln said, if he had five hours to cut down a tree, he'd spend the four sharpening his axe. And that was my thing to study for, for so, so long. Mm -hmm. And I got a big smack up the ass last week from Spirit saying, your axe is sharp. It's time to cut some freaking trees. Nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and I used it for so long to, to help push me to go, you've got to add you talk it, you got to add to your you got to, you got to learn, yeah. fill that brain. Yeah. There's things you could be doing with that that I'm not. So I don't that's, yeah, that's uh, that's part of it. In my office, I've got a different one. By the same artist, uh, where it's uh, every the best 
time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Yeah, I love that quote. I have no idea whose quote that is. It's just... <laughs> it's an anonymous quote, quote I think. I, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I just uh, love it. I love, the, I love the Abe Lincoln quote because it, it strikes a chord with me because for people that suffer from anxiety and don't feel that they have accomplished their purpose or their desires in life, the better way of looking at it is that you are sharpening your ax. You're, you're getting something ready for when you actually want to cut that tree down. And when Lance said that to me during, uh, during my session with him, it was just like, Phew, that is very much true. And just like Lance, to get to where I am now, I would not change a single thing. I think we need to go through some form of experience uh, that is near hell-like, near Swedenborgian hell-like, uh, to get to where we are now. And that can be considered sharpening of an axe. So, wonderful. Is, yes. Yeah. Lance, thank you so much. I hope that if I was to ask you to come out back on the podcast, you would. In a heartbeat. I love it. <laughs> Perfect. Guys, that's the program. Thank you so much. Please, come back to What Magic Is This? We'll talk about some more of this crazy, weird stuff that you all love and uh, and enjoy. More stories. Yes, that's what this podcast is all about. Uh, so yeah, please come on back and we will talk at you soon. Stay healthy and stay helpful. Stay luminous. Bye-bye. Thank you all. <laughs>